We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Dan Geshrin from UCLA School of Medicine could not make it, but again, we're lucky. We actually have his presentation captured and it will play in absence of Daniel Geshwin, but you will hear him narrate. Hi, this is Dan Geshwind, and I'm going to talk with you today about our work on human brain evolution and psychiatric disease liability. But before I start, I really want to congratulate Ajit, pa Pascal, Rusty, and colleagues not only for the development of this amazing institution and the meetings associated with it, but also just say how privileged I feel for being able to participate in, in several meetings over the years and how truly wonderful and unique this organization is. Before I get into the meat of my talk, I just wanna thank those who have done most of the work. The work that I'm gonna talk about today on evolution was led by Hei Jung Wan, with other contributions from Luis de la Torre Ubieda and Jason Stein. But a lot of what we do involves teamwork and a, and a great group of postdoc students and technicians in the laboratory who are all listed here and shown in the picture. The basic framing of what I wanna to talk to you about today is based on the question whether psychiatric diseases, either as a whole or individually, are a consequence of factors that underlie aspects of human cognition that are distinct. We know that many aspects of human cognition and behavior as well as brain structure are highly heritable. They're also in, subject to environmental effects. So please don't get me wrong. I'm gonna be talking about genetics, but I'm not talking about genetic determinism. What's wonderful is that advances in understanding the genetic contributions to neuropsychiatric diseases now permit us to begin to understand how disease risk relates to other human phenotypes and brain evolution. And that's what I'm gonna focus on in my short talk today. Just to, again, provide another reference for framing. Genes act during development with, along with the environment, leading to the cerebral structure and brain structure. I refer to structure, not as a static structure, but dynamic, ranging from molecular all the way up to the gross anatomical. And this in turn is the organ that underlies behavior and cognitive function and that you can see the two-way arrow because cognitive function and behavior also impacts brain structure. As we learn, as we grow, et cetera, the brain structure changes. But brain development and cognition, despite the environmental influences, are highly heritable. And because the genome is finite, we can use this fact to identify the genetic factors that lead and that underlie either susceptibility to certain conditions or any cognitive phenotype. So the heritability of major brain structures is very high and the heritability of cognition and behavior are lower but still very significant. IQ ranging from 0.5 to 0.7, um, language heritability depending on what, what one looks at is around 0.5, et cetera. Neuropsychiatric disorders are also highly heritable so that what we have here are listed by lifetime prevalence from the top anxiety disorders to the bottom Tourette syndrome, schizophrenia, and autism. One can see that the heritabilities 
uh, with some confidence, range from 40 to 80 percent. Again, this is as high as the heritability for cognitive functions and higher than, than uh, many. So the question is, although very heritable, what kinds of genetic variation underlie this heritability or underlie the non-heritable genetic components? To understand that, we have to think a little bit about where we arose from. Humans have grown very quickly from small ancestral populations, so that we're all related to a pool, small pool of common ancestors 10,000 years ago. And from that, our gene pool has expanded, but we still share common variation. Most genetic is variation is common and arose more than 10,000 years ago. But this variation has been acted on by natural selection, so strong bad actors, um, things that would really affect fecundity, are, have been removed. And so common variation is gonna have small effect sizes with regard to disease. Whereas rare variants or de novo new variants could have very large effects. And so if we look at frequency versus effect size, it's the large effect mutations that have the very large effect sizes that cause disease that are very low frequency in the population. And things at higher frequency, we identify using GWAS or genome-wide association studies, but these are small effect size. So you can either have a combination of many, many, many small effect alleles or one large effect allele just to dichotomize much risk is in between, a combination of both. What one key question is why should common variation persist if it is deleterious or not adapted in some, adaptive in some manner? Why do variants that appear to diminish social behavior remain common in the population? So one way to begin to look at that is to ask, how does risk for autism relate to other factors? Could it be related to things that are under positive selection? And so one of the interesting observations more recently that's been validated is that autism is positively correlated at about 0.3 with um, educational attainment, which we think of as a good thing. That's a positive. The higher the educational attainment, uh, the more education somebody has. And autism risk is also strongly correlated with G. This is a meta-analysis of GWAS for G, which is a uh, major factor related to intelligence. One can see that schizophrenia in contrast and ADHD are negatively correlated with G. So again, both educational attainment and um, some measure of IQ or, or intellectual functioning is positively associated with autism risk. So is that under positive selection? No. As a matter of fact, it's the other way around. This is work from Decode in Iceland that shows that since 1910, educational attainment is under negative selection. Both the number of children, which is negatively correlated with educational attainment, and then the age at first child or the age at childbirth um, are positively correlated. In other words, older at first child or childbirth um, on average with higher educational attainment. And this makes sense, more education, later children, fewer children. So it's actually under negative selection. So this raises many questions, but also provides many opportunities. If we can identify overlapping and non-overlapping genetic components of these psychiatric disorders, we can then ask, what are the specific molecular, cellular, and brain circuit functions represented by these? And then we can ask, how do selection pressures act on these distinct aspects of disease risk or biology? I don't have answers for those, but that's the kind of set of questions that's driving our, our current aspect of this work. This third question, are there general factors that increase risk for psychiatric disorders? Uh, the answer is yes, and I'm just going to provide a, some quick data on that that was recently published in collaborative work with the iPsych Consortium, which is a Danish population-based study of six major psychiatric disorders shown here, ADHD, affective disorder, anorexia, a autism, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia, and then the cross disorder, the XDX. And one can see on this graph of SNP heritability that the XDX is at least as high, if not higher, in terms of its common variant-based heritability than some of these actual disorders. In other words, there's strong heritability for things that provide risk or um, across well, for any disorder and that aren't specific to any disorder. And to show you that they're not specific, here are the top genome-wide association hits. And one can see in the blue that none of these 
it, it, these aren't being driven by one disease simply. The odds ratios are, are kind of above one for all of the disorders for the first three and below one for this SNP that reduces risk for cross-disorder psychiatric impairment. So what this is telling us is that in addition to the specific risk for disease, there are factors that um, provide uh, general risk. And so we were interested in asking some more questions about this. For example, can we identify uh, biology? What does this mean? What is the, when do these act? And, and do they act in the brain? And the answer is yes. The genes that are implicated by the GWAS are expressed most highly at mid-gestation, at the peak of cortical neurogenesis and migration. And this is shown left as prenatal, right as postnatal gene expression, just shown in a different way. So this implicates the fetal period as really an essential period for the action of these genetic variants. And this has been supported in other work that we've done looking at other conditions, not just cross disorder, but individual conditions. Here we show even adult disorders like depression and depressive symptoms, um, schizophrenia, which is not an early onset disorder, and educational attainment, as well as intracranial volume, are all at least as strongly driven by um, regions of the genome that are active during fetal brain development as they are during adult. Now, how do we connect these genetic risk to specific genes? And since biology is driven by gene regulation that occurs at the cell type and tissue specific level, we have to look at these specific time points during fetal development and its cerebral cortex. And we've done that using a variety of methods. But one of these chromosome confirmation actually tells you which gene is likely to be the target of the actual genetic variant. And so we've now made maps that map the gene regulatory elements onto their target genes during fetal brain development. So the one question we asked is what aspects of genetic and epigenetic regulation during fetal development have developed on the human lineage? And so I'm gonna dichotomize this into two forms of variation. Genetic, which is represented by these areas called human accelerated regions or HARs. These are regions that are highly conserved in mammals but that have changed very fast between chimpanzees and humans, and they overlap strongly with developmental enhancers. And I, um, I have the reference below, um, that's most recent, Capra et al. And then these human gained enhancers, which are actually not DNA sequence, but epigenetic changes in chromatin structure and histone modification that shows that these enhancers are much more active in human brain. And this is again cartooned here, a har, will have variants on, at the DNA level on, on, you know, that have arisen on the human lineage, whereas those human-gained enhancers that are expressed in the fetal brain, most, most active during fetal brain development, will, have, will be more open or more active, as shown here by this, by this uh, peak. And there are those that are more active in the adult brain will show a similar peak. So we can divide the human-gained enhancers into those that are fetally active and those that are adult active. Now, some of this work was spurred on by really seminal work done by Chris Walsh's lab that showed that mutations in these HARs actually disrupt are related to autism and intellectual disability. And that's in this paper in Cell in 2016. We wanted to ask, not only are the HARs affected, but now that we have these regulatory maps, can we identify are the actual genes regulated by HARs in um, likely associated with autism, schizophrenia, intellectual disability. The first question we asked, though, was when and where are they expressed? Are these HARs or human-gained enhancers expressed in the cell types and in the regions that are responsible for human cortical expansion? And the answer is yes. Here we can see that the HARs and all of these classes of human-gained enhancers are highly enriched in the outer radial glia, which is a neurogenic zone that's expanded massively in non-human primates, as well as in endothelial cells, which shares some gene expression. If we look in adult, we see, if we, again, if we just focus on the HARs and the human-gained enhancer in fetal brain, we can see there is a, as well as the uh, um, um, adult brain, these are lost enhancers, and I'm not gonna focus on them, but they're regions of the genome that have been lost. These elements are, open and the genes that they're regulating are more expressed in the supergranular layers, which are expanded in primates. 
So we can conclude from this that elements that are being selected on the human lineage converge on cerebral cortical expansion and gyrification. So we, we not only know now from a genetic and epigenetic perspective that these have changed on the human lineage, but they're changing in the cell types and anatomical regions that have already been implicated in human and primate brain expansion. So when we then look to ask about these elements and ask if various classes of risk genes, we were surprised to find that autism, de novo loss of function genes are indeed enriched in HARS, that if, it's, if one looks at genes that are in the most constrained category, that is, are very unlikely to harbor mutations in humans, those are enriched in both human gain enhancers and HARS, as well as CNVs that cause schizophrenia, the genes within them are enriched in HARS, in, are genes that are more likely to be regulated by HARS. And we see the same thing with genes involved in developmental delay broadly, which is intellectual disability and kind of fairly nonspecific. And one of the strongest signals is with just genes that are highly constrained. That is that highly, highly constrained genes whose protein sequences can't change very much are actually paradoxically or perhaps understandably under the control of these regions that have, that have changed very greatly on the human lineage. Again, this fits with the King and Wilson hypothesis that it's regulatory regions, not the proteins themselves. So in summary, genes causing neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism and schizophrenia, are under control of human-specific regulatory elements, and that aspects of psychiatric disease risk are related to human cortical expansion and human brain evolution. And this is just a start, and as, we, and as we begin to get more of a handle on common variation, we'll be able to look at that in much more detail. Thank you very much for your attention.